But yeah, sim simple to grow, and that's why we sort of chose it. We thought if it, you know, if it, if it doesn't come to anything because cheapest, cheapest thing, thing that's, to and that's that's why it's going to be always probably the hardest thing to sell because it's the easiest thing to grow. Um, essentially, yeah, I've just been ringing anyone from Queensland through to South Australia, trying to move the stuff. Um, it's a depressed market this year because there's a fair bit around. Because uh, bird seeds limited. Um, you could export it, but the dollar's killing it at the moment, so I really don't think there's going to be any export market this year at all. So essentially all mine... So we ended up with 300 tonne of millet. Um, no, no. We've, got, we've got some going into a seed market, uh, and the rest of it's going to be uh, probably going into the bird seed market through traders at this stage. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, we're lucky enough we've got aerated storage, so we're able to store it because it's got to be stored, um, kept cool. Like often it's pulled off at high moisture. Lucky enough we had a dry May that we were able to get it off without having to um, have to dry it. So we just put it straight into aeration and aerated it. But yeah, look, it's one of those things you've got to be prepared to sit on it. And you know, you might have to, we might have to sit on it till almost harvest, um, which doesn't really excite me. But we th hope to think we can get rid of it most of it in the next two months. But yeah, look, it's, one, it's a bit like um, coriander, mung beans, those sort of things that they can be good. They can be very, very good money for it, but it always, tends to be that if there's, if there's not much around, it's always the good price, and if there's plenty around, there's a crap price. So last year, you know, Millet was making, uh, well, that was Chiro Millet. Last year we did white French, in, sorry, in the trial we did white French, and is probably a high return, a high value crop. But last year, Chiro Millet uh, was probably up around about $1,000 a tonne, but only because it was short. So, but this year, because there's plenty of it around, like just talking to one of the buyers the other day, he said, oh, you know, he's just heard of another 200 tonne that's popped up out of hay that guys hadn't, you know, hadn't, hadn't contacted the market with. So there's, but the only thing I've heard out of Queensland is a lot of it, uh, or quite a bit of it, uh, was wet before harvest, so there's still a bit of, a bit suspect about sure the germination. Uh, don't know, because we never really tried to get rid of white. We only had that eight or 10 tonne off the trial. Um, it's, it's, it always seems to be a higher price for it. Um, I think there's more of an export market for the Chiro than the white French. Is that right? Someone's nodding, so... Yeah, okay, yep. Um, also, sorry, on that, you know, I'll actually do a bit of experience here. Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. So I'm just wondering, having seen it under irrigation, it doesn't have any, uh, what's going to be your um, nutrient management program in the dry land? You know, have you thought of anything? Essentially, if we were going to, like that one there, we were going to put nitrogen on it, but essentially we couldn't get back on the country. It was too wet over the summer, so, and it grew that quickly with the moisture we had last year. We really didn't get an opportunity to do it. But put it, if, if, it was, if we were going to grow it, Again, we'd just do like any other wheat crop or canola crop. We'd be deep end testing and just doing a nitrogen budget and nutrient budget and, and doing it that way. Yep. So, but yeah, there's only really through just lack of opportunity last year. We couldn't get any nitrogen there. It was the pace was just that wet. We, I mean, we could have flown it on, but yeah, we didn't get it on. So, and look, at that stage, we didn't know where to get through to harvest either. So, we, and it sort of. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. We had nowhere to land. So, um, so yeah. So we got it through this year. Um, the only problem with the millet I don't like about the millet is it takes up um, takes up uh, time at so at uh, harvest time. Um, is it, you know you're in there December, sometime in December sowing it. Um, so this year we're in the unfortunate position again, once again through circumstances we still haven't got 350 acres of area not sown because it was too wet after harvest. And but we, well I've, I gave myself until the end of July to sow wheat, but I'll probably push that through to mid-August now. And if we don't get that sown by mid-August, we're going to have to obviously go into a summer crop or fallow it through. So we're thinking this year that we're probably more likely to go to uh, perhaps to um, grain sorghum, uh, or or possibly I'd like to I'd like to try some maize. Um, the big thing that I worry about the maize is the high cost of, of establishment, and the fact that those pegs that we haven't sown, we actually burnt the stubble back in April to try and get them to dry out so we could get on them, but they just haven't dried out. So we haven't got any stubble cover there to sow into, so the earlier we can get something established and get going and try and get some ground cover, uh, the probably better off we're likely to do. Um, but I mean, we'll have a full profile of moisture,
But if we go into a normal summer, that'll really test the system to see how we go in terms of, in terms of production, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I guess we're, we're sort of splitting up our thoughts now is we've either got to make a decision, are we just going to use summer cropping as an opportunistic crop after harvest? That, I mean, the big one I see is, and we actually we tried some, uh, well, sort of tried it by default, really, that when I sowed this millet, I still had some in the box, and I went and just sowed a couple of small paddocks around the house, but they'd had alloy under the spray bar when we windrowed the canola, and the alloy knocked the millet germination around because... Um, Millet's pretty sen uh, sensitive to um, sulf on your ears. But it's sort of good in some ways because we've got some, we've got good, uh, good germination and establishment and areas that others that were bare. So I actually let, let that go th virtually through to flowering. We've sprayed that out and we've sown wheat back into those paddocks. So we're going to yield monitor that this year and see actually what the response is in the wheat from, the, from having that summer crop actually just grown as a cover crop over the summer. Because, I mean, that's... One of the things we see, you know, we're growing legumes, or say faba beans and, and say the canola, is we, we have no uh, cover crop over the summer um, and we're losing any moisture that we get in rainfall because we've got no cover there. That, you know, what's the response in actually going in straight after harvest, um, moisture or no moisture, just drilling, virtually following the um, header, uh, drill some uh, millet in because it's cheap and easy, just drill some millet in from, for some ground cover, um, get some moisture, that, get that up and going, and even if it only gets you know, six inches high, two foot high, whatever, just spray it out if it's not going to get through to seed and just use that as a sort of a, as a mulch crop uh, to then, when you get that April rain, and that April rain's the, you know, rain at April is different to rain in, in July. You know, the rate of return on your, your moisture at different times of the year, it's not all the same. So that April rain's probably the most valuable rain we get, perhaps other than the September, October rain. So whatever moisture we can hang on in September, uh, sorry, in April, is worth a lot of money to us in terms of getting crops up and established for, for that year. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the wheat, the wheat yields actually go after the um, yield after that millet over the summer to see how they respond. Um, OK, that didn't show up. Anyways, but the next problem we've got is with the summer crops is, is going back into, is going back into um, uh, that next winter crop. And that's actually the photo before just showed the cedar um, in that stubble and that because this millet ended up about this is the stuff we sowed in December the millet ended up about you know, sort of five and a half six foot tall we were going to try and wind right reasonably low um, so we didn't have a lot of uh, residue left but the problem was the, the wind rows were too heavy for the stubble uh, and they were just sinking on the ground and we just knew if they sat on the ground they mightn't dry well and we wouldn't get them harvested so we ended up having to I'll sort of windrow up anywhere, so sort of from knee high to waist high, depending on how tall the um, the millet was, um, which we knew was going to present problems at, potentially at seeding. So that that millet there was virtually, you know, well it was probably I guess it was sort of halfway between the knee, knee and your hip, um, but you know seeding, and that's actually seeded. That's actually seeded straight down the middle of the, of the old row. So, you know, everyone, we talk about inter-row sowing, but with this drill, we've actually been playing around with intra-row sowing, so we're actually sowing right back on the same row again. Um, and that half that paddock, we did half of it offset by eight centimetres, and the other half we did, we've done straight down the middle of the row. Um, but, yeah, we, we actually, uh, we burnt the wind rows behind the header because cause the straw was... Um, pretty dough, it wouldn't smash up and spread. So we just dropped the spinners off, burnt those wind rows, and then we just drilled straight back into it. So that, that's probably one of the limitations of the summer crop is making sure you can get back in and establish the crop after the, um, after the summer crop, especially in things like millet, like that's sown on 31 centimetre rows. So you've got a fair, fair residue load to sow back into. Um, so I guess, you know, going back to the original thing of why we consider these summer crops, I guess these were just some of the points I put down is why I guess we have considered them and why we think we might consider using them is that, no, I guess it opens up our sowing windows. I guess that's been pretty evident, especially the last 12 months with the, with the floods and then the, the wet conditions, this sowing period is not being able to get some country sown. At least it gives us an opportunity to, to go back and sow uh, crops. You know, essentially we've got a sowing window now, I guess, of probably six, six to eight months of the year instead of just being in those two months of the year in April and May. Um, I mean, since we've gone into that no-till full stubble retention, you know, we've got more moisture available. I mean, in this year we actually had too much moisture and we had to burn all our stubbles to try and get the packs just to dry out to get to sow them. But, you know, in, in most years that extra moisture is available there that we, we're going to try and exploit if we've got it or if we have to. 